I'm sorry, if you're in the front, I'm going to shout quite loud. Is there are quite a few people here. Yeah. Woo I want to say thank you so much to for everybody for coming. Um, we've got people coming from Leicester, from the Wirral. Give me a shout out if you come from afar.
Um, yeah, many of you have got it. There you go. Many of you have. And, and I did a few talks on money, and I thought, well, I wanted to do something different for those of you that have come to see me at other events. So, the thing I always get asked is, how did you get into property with no money? That is the most common question I get. And essentially what happened was, I wrapped up a lot of credit card debt. It started going to uni, um, and I racked up a, a decent amount of debt there, and my dad racked up a lot of debt too, putting me through university. Now, I was the, that was the last year where student fees were paid for, so my debts would have been even worse if I'd have had to pay my fees. I didn't even have to pay my fees, and my dad was paying for my student gigs and all that. And it, it put a lot of pressure on him in put, putting me through um, schools and university and that kind of thing. And I probably racked up 15, 20 grand worth of debt. I did an architecture degree. And then the day I left the, the um, uni, I went and worked in my dad's pub because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And my dad's always been there and he's always said, look, son, you know, I'm always here if you need a job. But the problem was I relied on that and therefore I never, up until the age of 26 nearly, stood on, on my own two feet. I always knew I could go back and work for mum and dad in the pub. And that's not a criticism of them because they gave me all the support. But I, I just never really took ownership of my life in terms of business. Um, so I went home and I ended up staying working in the pub for another two, three years. And I racked, got myself into sort of 35, 40 grand worth of credit card debt. And at this point now, I'm like credit cards to pay credit cards to pay credit cards to pay credit cards. Um, my dad's quite a fiery character, and um, I'm quite a fiery character. So one day he fired me. He actually, I don't know if you when you have bars and pubs, you get Walker's crisps in boxes of 48, and he lobbed one of those at me. I'm um, in front of uh, about 60 customers, and I said, you can fucking stick that up your fucking ass. And he said, you can stick that fucking job up your ass, get the fuck out. So I got the fuck out. Um, now, I live next door to the house. Um, it's taken him years to get me out of living out of the pub, and he ended up buying the house for me next door. So he didn't quite get me that far away. And between walking out of the pub, thinking, what am I going to do with my life, and going next door, I thought, well, I'll be an artist. Because I could paint and draw at school. What a revelation. What a fucking genius this guy is. Um, so I started painting. And I got myself into more debt. And every business I tried, I failed at. Now, thankfully, I didn't go bust, but I was always like a couple of weeks away from going bust, like every month, struggling to pay all the bills, hoping that someone was going to sell one of my pieces of art somewhere or, you know, I was going to be saved. And it literally was hand to mouth, hand to mouth, the whole time. And in the period of that time, that's probably from what, we're talking a seven year period now where I'm a kind of in the wilderness. <coughs> My dad had been saying to me, every sort of six months, son, you should get into property, 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 you should get into property. Every six months, down the road, Swan Gardens, off the plan, estate agents were selling it, 25 grand for a one bed flat, you should get into property. Then six months later, they're 30 grand, six months later, they're 35, they're 40, they're 50, they're now like 130 now. And every time he came to me and said that, I said the same things that thousands of people now say to me. Which is, Dad, I ain't got any money. I ain't got any deposits. I ain't got any experience. I ain't got any knowledge. I'm an artist. I'm working full time. I'm busy. I can't. All that stuff. And I said that for seven years in whatever form. And then I had a gallery owner, Mike, who I think he hung my art in his gallery for sympathy because it didn't really go with his posh furniture. Because my art was, I used to listen to German heavy metal at two o'clock in the morning. And basically, it, it might as well have been painted in my own blood. Um, it was dark, it was really fucking dark. And then when you get more depressed, you put Radiohead on just to cheer your fucking self. <laughs> Why am I doing this to myself? For art! For art. It's my art. Hang that mark's like, ooh. All right, I'll put it up. I'm not sure they'll buy it, but I'll give it a go. And it was really nice to me, and he gave me a chance. And he'd always phone me if there was a, a commission check. And when I say he'd always phone me, he'd never phone me, but if there was one, he'd phone me. But I used to go in every couple of weeks anyway, hoping that he'd forgotten to phone me, then he was going to have a check. And then I'd go in, and I'd buy some of his nice furniture and stuff and put it on another fucking credit card. So he had a good little deal out of me there. Um, and then one day he said, you should go to this property event. 
And I'm like, well, I can't do property, I haven't got any money. Yada, yada. And then he just kept having a go at me like my dad did, in a nice way. He wanted me to go for me. He wasn't trying to sell me or push me. He cared about me, and I know that now. And he's like, you should go, you should go. And in the end, I was like, like many of you get dragged to some of these events that maybe, you know, your husband or your wife is off on it and you're driving, driving around the country and you get dragged along. You're like, all right, for fuck's sake, I'll go. Just leave me alone. And I went to the Holiday Inn in Peterborough, where I went and did a speech last month. And I, I got my Vista print business cards, the cheapy free ones. And I couldn't look people in the eye because, you know, like, art is not really conducive to being a having bravado and being into property and business and selling and stuff. Afternoon. Um, <laughs> and I went and I saw a guy speak called Warren Bourget. And this guy, like, he, everything about him was what I wanted to be, but I wouldn't admit it. Like, he had a six-pack on his face. He was ripped. <laughs> and um, he was really well tanned. You know, he wore the jacket, but with the T-shirt, not the shirt. He was super cool. He was kind of leaning over the desk. He was looking everyone in the eye. He was like, you know, and he got properties all over the world, and he had passive income, and he travelled the world, and he's a speaker, and he's living the dream, and doing what he loves, and loves what he does, and all of this. And I'm like, yeah, I want to be you. But I also thought, and you're a dick. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not funny, didn't we? <laughs> we have each other. Well, yeah. <laughs> and everything about him that I wanted to be, I hated about myself that I wasn't. And so it was a hard thing to see this guy, because it was like two voices. I want a better life, I want a freedom, I want time, I want this. But why you? And you must have had money, and you must have been given gifts, and look at you. Nothing big, nothing new, thank you, you know, like People often now think about me. He had a Ferrari. I thought, what a twat, I've got a Ferrari, I've become him. <laughs> so I can't drive them as well as he can, all this stuff. But thankfully, all this stuff was going on in my head, but I didn't say anything, and it's a good job I didn't. And I went and networked with everyone at the end, because you're supposed to, but I kind of just thought, I'm going home. This is... Not for me. I'm going to go home and sulk and paint. And, um, and I was sort of, I kind of sort of put my card in everyone's face and I sat down at the bar. And at that stage, even getting a round of drinks or going out for a meal was hard because I knew it was going on a credit card. And so it's one of those awkward situations where there's someone there and someone there and it's like I'm kind of thinking, well, why don't you just ask me if I want a drink? And he was looking at me like, who are you? And there was this awkward silence. And so in the end, because I'm like a bit like, oh, no, 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 awkward silence is, do you want a drink? And he went, Diet Coke. <laughs> and I gave him the Diet Coke. And I went, thanks. And I thought, what a grumpy twat. <laughs> and that was Mark Homer, who, if you don't know, is my business partner, my best friend. Many, many of the best things that have happened in my life outside my immediate family have come through him and thanks to him. <coughs> and had I not met him, my life would have been very different. And if he was here, I'd give him the gratitude that he deserves. Um, and I'll come back to that point in a minute. As you were all coming in, someone said to me, hi, you know, I'm blah, 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 that chap, has it been a treacherous journey? And that was quite an interesting word, treacherous. And I said to him, no, it's been amazing. Property's been great to me. There's a billion people in the third world starving, and all my problems are first world problems. You know, my problems are, people take photos of my Ferrari and put me on a parking like a twat in Peterborough website. <laughs> <laughs> Um, even though I wasn't parking like a twat, how else do you park when you fill up your car with petrol? I need to let that one go. <laughs> <laughs> and property has been amazing to me. Because everything in life that was failing before, money, business, finding my passion, doing what I love, all of that that I lacked when I was an artist and a pub landlord and trying to do a degree. I only did a degree because I didn't want people to think I was thick. I didn't even want to do architecture. I did it because of what I thought other people may or may not think about me. How stupid is that? Three year degree. And I don't even use it. And then I got into property and property has just been an amazing crazy ride. I was just talking to Steve, Steve Rice at the back. 
Um, he's just put his hand up, who I've been working with for many years, and he just said, Rob, this is crazy. You get into it, you're not really sure, and then all of a sudden all these opportunities happen and the numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's just a crazy journey, and it's so exciting. And that's what it is. And there are all these different strategies. And you can get income from all over the place. And in your job, you've got one source of income, probably from someone you don't respect, admire, or want to be like. But in property, you know, you've got service accommodation, deal packaging, you've got commercial conversion, you've got all sorts of different types of commercial property. You've got single lets, you've got HMO. If you've got a lot of knowledge, you can become a trainer, you can write books, you can run courses. There's a million, thing, a million ways to make money in property. And property literally saved me. Because I proved that before property, I could take a business model and completely screw it up. <laughs> and then property... You know, all the things you've probably heard, it doubles every 10 years. You know, it will look after you if you buy assets and hold them. And all those things are true. And so whatever stage of your journey you're at, what I would say to you is, just keep going. I've spoken to beginners and I've spoken to seasoned investors. Glenn said to me, he's raised this million, that million, this million in meetings today. And then a couple of people said to me, Rob, this is my first time. I'm just learning. I'm going to start in January. So we're all at a different stage. But if in one, three, five, and ten years, this is my eleventh year, you're still turning up, you're still implementing your strategies, you're reading the books, you're listening to the podcasts, you're going on the right courses for you, you're networking, you're giving as much as you're taking, you are going to be seriously wealthy and a lot more happy. And, you know, like many people have talked to me about my son and what I do with him with his golf. I would not be able to travel the world with my son and enter him in the World Championships and the British Championships and spend hours a day on the courses. By the way, I, I, I'm up with Ariana as well in the mornings now. She's just turned three and, um, you know, she loves it. And I wouldn't be able to spend all the time with them if it wasn't the, for the passive income from the properties. Mark and I own about 720 that we own or we, we mostly co-own them all. He had, about, he had about a dozen before me. I've got a handful because they were sort of mine before we did our partnership. Uh, some, are, um, some we manage and we have a third JV partner. You know, every single one of those properties has enabled me that lifestyle. It enables me to do what I love, which is the teaching, the training, the speaking, the sharing, the videos, the books, the courses, you know, all of that side of the business. Um, I don't really enjoy the day-to-day -day dealing with tenants, mortgage brokers, solicitors, planners, conveyancers, all of that. And that's a necessary part of building your portfolio. Mark loves that. Mark loves to get into the nuts and bolts detail of a deal. So our partnership is very, very delineated. And if, there, you know, if, you, if there's anything you want to take a note on, this is definitely a part to pause. Is that your JVs will work the best when you have clear, delineated roles and responsibilities and you are the yin of your partner's yang. And I see so many people when they start and they come to networking events and they're excited and enthused, just like you are and just like you should be. And you meet someone and you like them and you build some trust and you think, hey, I trust you, I like you, let's JV. But you have no idea if they've got complementary and opposing skill sets. And all you end up doing is following each other round for three to six months and then you piss each other off and then you fuck each other off. And then you repeat the process. And I see that a lot. And the reason it worked with Mark and myself is as follows. So make sure you've got delineated roles and responsibilities and you joint venture with people who've got opposing skills, desires... But, and this is important, a similar vision. So people always say to me, well, how long do you like holding properties? Forever. People always say to me, what's your exit strategy? Death! <laughs> and Mark has a similar vision. He's one year younger than me, he wants to hold his properties forever, and he wants to do property until he dies. If he dies a decade or two before me, I'll make a bit more money than him. <laughs> if not... Half my estate will be going to him, you know, win-win. Um, now, this is what Mark told me he did, and I didn't know this. And it's a good job I didn't know this. What he told me he did was, met me, also thought I was fucking weird. He likes to make that point, because I make that point about him. Also thought I was a twat. Um, didn't really get me. Because I'm like, mate, what do you do for social time, property? What do you do with your mates? Property. <laughs> what did you do when you were younger? Property. <laughs> what did you learn at school? Economics. <laughs> oh, I've never met anyone like that. 
if you'd have asked me what do I do, or I could down the pint in three seconds. <laughs> we used to snort tequila at university. <laughs> That's one for the video. <laughs> My show reel. Odd <laughs> record holder, public speaker, nine times author, and could snort tequila. <laughs> I've never actually told anyone that. <laughs> so, this is what Mark told me he did. He said, he watched me for two or three months, he tested me with a few things, and then, when he got the evidence he needed, he came to me, or let me, in on where he was at. So basically what happened was, we were meeting, and I was like, I'm learning, 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 you know, and he said, oh, you should read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So I went and read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I came back to him a couple of days later, because I exchanged his car, saying, I've read that, what else have you got? And he said, you should read, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, oh, sorry, Rich Man in Babylon. And think and grow rich, and who moved my cheese, and you know, all these. And I read them all. Um, I think what Mark expected when he said, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, was for me to disappear and never come back. Because he said that's what normally happens. But I came back a week later and I read all the books. Now, I'd never read a full book cover to cover since Fantastic Mr. Fox. <laughs> so that week wasn't that easy. I'm one of these readers that just says it. I thank God for two times speed audiobooks. I was online, passive, and my abilities, and blah, 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 doodads. I was walking around going, doodads, don't buy doodads. Didn't know what fucking doodads. <laughs> um, but what Mark said he saw in me was someone who wasn't there yet, but every week he saw me, I'd, you know, <coughs> worked hard, I'd learned, I'd read, I'd studied, I'd listened, and he could see I was getting there. Now, he didn't need me to have the money, because he had the money. Now, this is something else he said to me. Um, retrospectively is, you know, I never told you for a long time how much money I had. Because if I had, you'd have behaved differently. And he was right about that. I'd have behaved differently. In, on the first meeting, I'd just uh, panicked, whatever else. And then if I'd have known a week or two later, I'd have probably hounded him for the money. And Mark wouldn't have wanted to be hounded for the money until he's ready. So I waited three months, and then I hounded him for the money. Now, Mark got really pissed. Really, 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 really pissed. So pissed he threw a strawberry daiquiri over his ex-girlfriend's white dress. I've never told anyone about that as well. <laughs> she was out with a new boyfriend. I don't think he was over it. Hiya. What? <laughs> um, <coughs> and um, he got really hammered. And he, he never told me how much money he had. But he said, I've got enough money for more. More than X properties cash. I was like, ooh, daiquiri. I've got more. I, in fact, I've got money for X times two properties for cash. And it took him a few months to open up to me. And he did that on purpose. So the next thing I'd like you to write down, because this isn't just me telling you random shit that happened, there's a purpose to it all, and that is people are watching you right now. And they're not... Anyone in this room who's got money and go, I just want to let you know, I've got a couple of mil, don't fuck it up and it's yours. <laughs> they're not going to tell you, because they're going to get mobbed. Because you're going, they're going to, you know, as soon as you know someone's got money, you go into sales pitch mode. Because you want the money. I would have probably done that and I'd have messed it up.